All right, let's do it. So today we are talking about this wonderful software here called Rolly Dashboard, formerly known as Blocks Dashboard, if anyone was around back in the day when it first got released. Um, Rolly Dashboard is a very misunderstood piece of software, I think, overall, from talking to artists, um, users, people who have Rolly products. A lot of people don't fully understand what Rolly Dashboard is, what it's capable of, and why they might want to use it. So, first things first, what is Rolly Dashboard? Rolly Dashboard is an application that you have installed on your computer, right? However, it is for controlling your hardware. So I'll say that again, Rolly Dashboard is an app that directly communicates with your hardware and does not communicate with any other software on your computer. Some people misunderstand Rolly Dashboard to be some kind of bridge software that you have to have it open, you know, so that the MIDI can go through Dashboard into Ableton or something like that. That is not how it works. Basically, a way you could think about it is that Rolly Dashboard is similar to like an LED screen that you might have on another MIDI controller. Maybe it's like an MPC or MPD or something like that, um, where there's settings on the controller that you can adjust, you know, by pressing buttons and turning knobs. Rolly Dashboard is like an extremely sophisticated version of the control surface of your hardware. So another thing to understand about how it works, and let me know guys if you can't hear or see anything properly, just throw it in the chat. Another thing to understand about how it works is that all of the changes that you make in Rolly Dashboard are instantly or as fast as possible uh, made visible and activated on your hardware. So anything I do in the app is going to happen on the hardware instantly. And also anything that you do in the app, and this is important, gets saved onto the internal memory of your hardware. So blocks, and the Seaboard have a certain amount of memory on the hardware. Uh, and so they actually can save all of these apps. All these changes are saved locally. So when I close Blocks Dashboard, or Rolly Dashboard, sorry, when I close Dashboard, all of the settings that I've changed will persist on my Blocks. I no longer need to have it open, which means you only need to open Rolly Dashboard if you ever want to make changes. Otherwise, you never need to open it. That is just an important concept. I think a lot of people misunderstand exactly what this app is. Now, on to the cool stuff about how it actually works. So, <clears throat> Rolly Dashboard is the most useful and exciting for the light pad blocks. However, it is also necessary and has some very important settings for Seaboard Block and Seaboard Rise. Um, however, I'll explain to you the differences there basically are not any options for apps when you're talking about the Seaboard. Um, however, with the LightPad, you have much more customizability because of its kind of open format uh, layout, right, with the LED grids. So <clears throat> let's start off with some of the just kind of basic concepts of how it works. The basic flow of Rolly dashboard is that you see up in this upper section, this is what <clears throat> could be called the visualizer, right? So the visualizer shows all of the blocks that you have connected, hopefully in the correct orientation, right? Um, it shows also a vague representation of what apps are currently loaded onto that block, right? It's not exactly the way it looks. You can see, obviously, this is a three by three grid and it's showing a four by four grid, but it's showing me that the control grid app is loaded onto it. I'll explain what this means in one second. So you have the visualizer, and then you have your app library here, right? So these are all of the available apps that you can load onto your light pad. And then within an app, you have modes. Now I have a ridiculous amount of modes here for the control grid app. Most people probably do not have anything like this, but the flow overall is that you select a light pad or a block, any kind of hardware, right? You select your hardware in the visualizer. By clicking on it, you'll get a little blue outline. Then you select an app that you want, right? So in this case, I have the note grid app, but I could load instead, let's say the mixer block app, right? And as soon as I click it, you see that the light pad actually adjusted to whatever I've selected. 
And then within that, I can go and choose a mode. I don't have any modes saved for my Mixer block, but we'll talk about that in one second, how to save modes. So again, to reiterate, the flow is visualizer, app, mode, right? These are the three layers that you need to understand about how the flow works. So a mode is a saved version of an app, right? So something that you've saved with your particular settings. Um, so let's really briefly look at that because it's a very important overall uh, process uh, just to understand as we're going to go deeper because this is a deep dive. Um, so let's just really quick, let's say I want to load up one of these apps. I'll go through them all later, but let's just to understand how to save a mode. I'm going to go into editing by clicking the edit button. Let's say I, for example, want to uh, change the colors of this, you know, these faders, right? I want them to be white and yellow and white and sure, green, right? This is, I just, for some reason, love these colors. And then I'm going to go up here and say, I want to save this mode as my webinar faders. Now here, I have a mode, right? So that is the basic concept. Now, anytime that I go back to the fader block, right? So I could select note grid again, right? If I want to go to note grid, note grid again is the default um, app. But if I go back into fader block, I'll have whatever is the default there. But if I want to have my webinar faders, now I've got my white, orangish, white, green, right? Okay, so that's a basic concept that you need to understand is that you can save modes that are a form of basically a saved setting group of an app. And an app you can think of as like a template or a layout um, or a general, you know, mode of function. But I like to think about it as templates. Um, and then you save your own versions of those templates, right? Okay, so, and also, as I said, please ask any questions in the q and I'm gonna mostly try to go through uh, as I go for all the things that I wanna hit, and then at the end, I'm gonna try to hit as many of the questions as I can, um, just to try to keep things a little bit more organized, otherwise I'll get too excited by some of the questions and go off on a tangent. Um, you can actually see right now uh, my dashboard visualizer got a little bit confused about where my blocks were. It doesn't really matter. It was still working. But just to show that if you disconnect your block, it will only show that one, right? And then as soon as you reconnect it in, um, it will show the rest of the blocks that you have connected. Sometimes the visualizer acts up a little bit um, because of the nature of having these magnetic connectors. Sometimes if they're a little misaligned, one of them's a little dirty, something like that, um, it won't always show properly. So. <clears throat> All right, now let's move on to looking at actually some of these modes, right? So I would say that, and again, right, the, the apps are only available, sorry, looking at some of these apps, the apps are only available when you are selecting a light pad block. If you're selecting a seaboard block or a control block, you don't get any apps, right? Um, so Let's actually really quick, before we even look at the apps, let's look at the basic settings that you would have for a Seaboard, right? And this is going to be very similar for Seaboard Block or the Seaboard Rise. Let's look at this really quick because this is a more general setting. These are things that you just need to know if you have a Seaboard about how to change. Um, but there's nothing too customizable or crazy that you can get into here. So again, I've clicked on my Seaboard in the visualizer. And here, I have all my different settings. These are all very important for how your Seaboard is going to function in the real world, right? So for example, oh, I'm not sure why my Seaboard was on single channel mode, but I have it in MPE mode now, which is what I will want if I am using this instrument with an MPE compatible virtual instrument, right? So if I'm using this with Equator, uh, or Cypher or Rolly Studio or anything that responds to the five dimensions of touch and has independent control, I'm going to want it to be in MPE mode. This is where the pitch bend range is. Very important. I talked about this briefly last week to make sure that your pitch bend range matches 
the pitch bend range that you're using in your virtual instrument. So that's how you set it here. Again, remember, these are the settings of the hardware, right? Um, so you need to make sure your hardware, of course, matches your software. Uh, so this is a pitch bend range, right? You can do all, these are all different MPE settings here that you have to deal with. You usually don't have to worry about them um, in terms of number of mini channels and lower zone, upper zone. But if anyone is interested in, in going deeper into this stuff, I can explain it, um, throw it in the question and answer. Basically, all right, I'll just really briefly touch on it. Basically, the way that MPE works in the background is that it actually translates every finger touch into its own MIDI channel. So this is just specifying how many possible finger touches you can have um, and how many MIDI channels you're using with this one instrument. Lower zone just specifies which global channel is going to carry things like sustain pedal or anything that's global. So lower zone means it's going to be on the first channel. Upper zone means it's going to be on the 16th channel. Uh, anyway, those things, again, not important. Most people don't have to worry about that. Okay, you've also got basic things like if you need to transpose the octave, which on the C-word block, you can also do just by tapping the uh, arrows in the top. Or if you wanted to put it into a different key for some reason, I've never done that. It would just confuse me because it looks like a piano and I'm used to it being like a piano. But if you ever wanted that, um, maybe you needed to play a song in, uh, I don't know, E minor or F sharp major, and you wanted it to be as easy to play as C major, you could just transpose up a couple steps, right? Um, until C would be equivalent to F sharp. So I guess that's you know a way that you could use that. Anyway, there's lots of other things here. These are all basic settings that, again, most of the time you're not going to need to use. But for example, you might want to turn on piano mode. Piano mode will make your, I'm going to just open up Equator really quick here. Uh, whoa, new version of Equator, like just now, perhaps. Hmm, not going to do that at the moment. That's exciting. Um, so for example, Ah, uh, yes. Sorry. Give me one second, guys. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. So, for example, let's just choose a sound that's easier to hear. Let me quickly stop this from making sound. Right, so now I am in piano mode. Right, they're all individual notes. Just to show you guys what piano, piano mode means, as opposed to the classic behavior you would expect from a seaboard, which is, right, piano mode is all individual notes. Um, so you have things like that. Glide rate is admittedly actually a pretty confusing parameter. You can't hear what I'm playing. Ah. Thank you very much. That makes sense. You should now be able to hear what I'm playing, hopefully. Let me know if not. Great, thank you guys, appreciate that. Um, so anyway, these settings I'm not gonna spend too long on now because we've got a lot to talk about. I don't wanna spend too long in here. The important things that you guys probably will have to adjust or want to adjust more often is the sensitivity section. These are five different graphs that represent how sensitive the product is to the five dimensions of touch, right? So strike, which is the same as velocity, is gonna say if I have it like this, it's gonna be linear. Whereas if I bring it down, then it's gonna be like, imagine if I brought it all the way down, everything's gonna be maximum velocity. Right, nothing's changing depending on how hard I hit. Um, glide sensitivity is similar, right? So if I have it like this, it's going to be linear. This is very similar if anyone has a Seaboard Rise to the touch faders that you have on the side of the Seaboard Rise. They are these controls. Um, or if you're using SongMaker Kit and you're in the faders section of the SongMaker Kit layout, these are also represented there. If I bring glide down, You can kind of hear that it's quantizing the pitch of uh, the notes that I'm playing. Okay, so this is very important, 5D touch uh, sensitivity settings. 
you know, generally in the left direction, you're going to have more quantized, less dynamic control. Um, in the right side, you're going to have a more dynamic playing experience. Um, great. So that's just to get that out of the way. These are the basic settings that you will need to change occasionally because this this will have a great impact on your playing style, right? So you're going to want to take these sensitivity settings and tweak them to exactly how you want to play. And maybe it's not always the same for every song, right? Or every preset. There might be some songs that you want to have more glide control so you can have a more, you know, evolving, tension-filled uh, part of your song. Or maybe you want to play a really fast solo, more piano style. And so you want to have just a tiny bit of bend potential just so you can do a little thing. But mostly you want the notes to be very in tune, right? Then you go to that side. So these are very important settings under the sensitivity side. And then these are important just because if they're wrong, it will the seaboard will not function at all the way that you think it will. So make sure your pitch run range is matched and make sure you've got the right overall MIDI setting. Okay, enough of that. Now let's get into apps on the light pad. This is what's the most fun for me. So I would say that apps are broken down into a few general categories, right? So you have apps that are based on you have apps that are for host specific purposes, right? So mostly for specific DAWs, right? DAW templates, um, DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, if anyone is not familiar with that terminology. Um, so for example, we've got the Ableton Live Control app. We have the GarageBand Control, Logic Control, Melodics. All of these are made for specific software, right? So they're actually what, if anyone is familiar with this kind of concept from other MIDI controllers, are called control scripts, right? So that software program actually has something in it that understands exactly how to communicate with blocks if they have these templates loaded onto them. So that's the first general category is, you know, host specific software, um, host specific apps, right? And then the other category that I would say could be called freely mappable controllers, right? They're more agnostic. These are things that you are customizing and then MIDI mapping inside of your DAW to do whatever you want specifically, not a pre-designed control script, but something more customizable. And then there's some other categories like games. You know, we've got some, some fun games here. Look, you can play Space Invaders if you want. Sorry, Blocks Vaders, not Space Invaders. Um, or like brick out, you know, break blocks. Um, you know, so this is all, okay, okay, I'm not so good at brick out. All right, fine. Um, ah, okay. But, you know, so there's like other kind of more silly, fun proof of concept things in here, but we're mostly going to be focusing on the music MIDI controller aspect side of things. So first, let's take a look at the DAW specific um, templates because they're pretty cool. I'm not going to be able to spend too long on each one because I think each one probably could be its own webinar, um, but I'm going to really quick try to show you guys all the potential that you have. So first uh, thing to understand about these DAW specific templates is that some of them are made for specific types of hardware configuration. So the Ableton Live Control app is made for a light pad, a single light pad, in fact, right? So, I mean, I can leave it connected to my blocks, but I could just use it as a single app, right? So I've loaded up, you see the Ableton logo, which is helpful for understanding what's going on. Now let's go into live for a second to see how this actually works. I can go into edit. If you see, if I go into edit, it's mostly the same controls that we just saw for the seaboard, right? So this is like, you know, just the basic controls that you might need. I you know, traditionally don't need to go in here unless maybe you want to change the scale or something that's useful. So if I go into Ableton Live here, I'm in Live 10, um, and if I have the control script set up now, this is an important thing inside of the preferences inside of Ableton for anyone who uses Ableton, normally this will always be on. I specifically turned it off. So you shouldn't need to do what I'm doing here to select your control surface. Normally, if you have a block collected, connected, it will automatically uh, have this turned on. But that's also something to be aware of because you might not necessarily always want to have it be on, which I will explain in a second. The 
Ableton Live Control Script is really cool. You can see, hopefully, fairly well on the... Oh, let me uh, pull up the camera so you guys can see what I'm looking at here. Sorry, I just got to briefly change the arrangement. Doing a little, little fancy multi-screen setup. So, hopefully you guys can see my light pad here. Uh, now, basically what this is showing me is my layout, right? So I'm gonna move this track to the end. I'm gonna, um, oh, I can't because of the zoom window. Okay, that's cool, fine. Um, I'm just gonna put in some random clips here that don't actually like have anything on them. Um, just so we can get the basic concept. Cause again, I can't spend too long on each of these individual things, but you can see, hopefully, that I can actually see all the clips that are laid out, right? So these, I'm going to move them up to the first slots. They're a little bit easier to see where we're at. You can see, and it actually coordinates the color, right? So this is a test of what I sound like. <laughs> so that was me talking before testing my microphone, right? Um, but you can see that I have them laid out here. And as I press them, it will actually launch those clips inside of the DAW. Right? And you can see it gives you a little animation to show that it's playing back. Um, so I can have it just be one clip, or I could launch all the clips you know, in a row, like all across, right? Um, and this is all pre-mapped, which is really cool. So you don't have to do any of this MIDI mapping yourself. Um, so it's nice. Basically, you have like a tiny little um, launch pad or kind of like you know push layout for launching your sessions. Um, I'm assuming that that was, um, Freddie says you can't see my block anymore. I'm assuming that you guys can see it, hopefully. Let me know if you still can't. Hopefully that was just when I had not moved it over yet. Um, cool, thank you. Great, 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 thanks so much. Um, okay, so this is cool. This is just for launching back your clips, but a really nice thing is if I were to arm a track, so let's say this is just like really basic operator, it's just like a little bloop sound, right? If I arm this and then I press the side button, right, which is called the mode button, it's the bigger of the two buttons. If I press that, then it will automatically start being an instrument controller. And you can see it's laid out in the notes of a major scale. Right, so that's really fun because um, it automatically will, you know, understand that you're controlling a synth, so you're going to want to have a, um, a layout that has notes, right? Again, if I was to be back in dashboard, I could actually change this to be a minor scale, for example. Um, and then I would have minor scale. Um, now, the cool thing is if I were to instead arm a drum rack, you, it automatically understands because these DAW templates are bi-directional, right? They're communicating in both directions. This actually understands that a drum rack track was armed. And so now it's gonna show me if I, if I were to have it mapped properly. Let's see. Why are we not hearing? Oh, it's because I turned off the instrument. Right, so now I've got these drums laid out. Now the cool thing is that actually if I were to record a clip, so let's just say, I'm just gonna uh, pardon the metronome for a second. Okay, so now I have this little clip recorded. It's actually nice that it even plays back the MIDI. This is what I'm trying to show you guys. I don't know how well you can see that on the camera with this bright light coming in the window. I might actually kill some of this light. Hopefully you guys can see that a little bit better now.
so it's nice. It goes in both directions, um, and so it makes it, you know, pretty fun to use. And again, automatically adapts to whatever's armed. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the Ableton Live Control app. Don't want to spend too much time on it. <laughs> now nah, I want to learn some finger drumming. Oh, we're going to be doing a lot more finger drumming in here. It's definitely my favorite. Um, all right, so very cool. Again, overview. It does clip launching. You can also navigate through the clip layout, right? So I'm actually... What it's showing you at any time are four rows and four tracks, right? So one, two, three, four tracks, um, and just four of these different lanes. So if I wanted to get to a clip that was, you know, down here in the sixth lane, you can see it's, let's make it like a white clip. Um, I have to use these navigation buttons on top and now I can see my little white clips because I'm just moving down. This is the down, this is the up, this is the right, and this is the left. Um, just so that's just, you know, overall uh, good stuff to know. This is stop all clips in the top right corner. And then again, whenever, whenever tracks you have armed, if you press the mode button, you can get instrument control or you can get drums. Also, this app is made to be uh, non-MPE, right? It's made to be in single channel mode because Ableton currently is not MPE compatible. Um, so it automatically will do that for you so you won't run into any issues, hopefully. Um, all right, so let's go back into dashboard um, and let's also grab this window and bring it into the dashboard world. Um, this is not what I'm supposed to be teaching you guys, but a very fun Mac functionality is that you can do split screen in case anyone doesn't know, just by holding down on the green button. It's a little, little tip. Um, okay, so now moving right along, let's load up a different app. Um, Let's try out, again, right now we're talking about the DAW-specific templates. These are the not, not customizable um, templates, but the ones that are made for really fast, seamless control, so you guys can get into using these apps as fast as you want. I'm going to use GarageBand right now, but the GarageBand and the Logic um, apps are exactly the same. So I'm going to load up GarageBand. Now, as I was saying before, the Ableton Live app is made for a single light pad block. The GarageBand app is, or Logic app, is made for the SongMaker kit, right? So it's actually made to have your blocks in a specific arrangement. <laughs> um, let's see. Hopefully you guys can kind of see most of it. You don't need to see the entire seaboard. Um, and so now... Let's see, I just had seen, now my visualizer wasn't working properly because my blocks were not properly seated. I just had to adjust a little bit and then it came up. Um, so I don't need to select anything for the seaboard, but I need to make sure I select GarageBand control on my light pad and I wanna make sure that I select GarageBand control on my loop block, right? Cause it could be on the factory default most likely, um, but you wanna make it go to GarageBand control. I'm gonna quickly go to Ableton and turn off this control surface um, so that we don't get any confusion going on. Um, unarm my drum rack and, oh, let's load up GarageBand. Okay, not too, not too long, not too bad. Um, Let's take this one more time over here. Oh, not available in split view. Bummer, GarageBand. Fine, fine, we'll use it like this. Um, okay, so the GarageBand Logic Control app is very cool because it gives you instant control over GarageBand. So first thing, I'm using the plus and minus buttons on my loop block which I'm gonna move over here so you can see it better. Um, and I'm navigating through my tracks. Other thing you can see instantly is that the light pad block is adapting to the type of track that I'm using. So if it's a synth, 
um, or anything else. Right? This is actually a quater that I have loaded up inside of GarageBand. Or drums. Let me make sure you guys can hear this also. Should be able to. Um, or a synth, right, is going to show me. It's going to show me whatever scale I've selected previously. Um, something I would definitely want to shout out is the drum layout is uh, a pretty unique layout for drums. Usually you'll find like the kick drum in the lower left corner, blah, blah. Um, I was working with the guys who were developing this um, and it's nice because it's basically like a symmetrical layout, right? So you actually have hi-hats on both sides. You have snares on both sides, kicks on both sides. So you can do a lot of fun, fast stuff like that. Um, I realize GarageBand's probably a little quiet for you guys based on the way I have the routing set up. But hopefully you can hear it. Um, oh yeah, a bit of latency. Yeah, we're doing some, some complex routing here. So unfortunately, might be unavoidable. Um, but that is just basically showing the instrument control layout, right? Another cool thing. And again, also I can be using the, um, of course I can be using the Seaboard um, as well for controlling instruments, right? Whatever track I have selected. You actually get a little volume animation here, which is kind of cool. It's showing you like the current volume, whatever you're playing. Um, now, if I press the speaker icon, it will switch over to the mixer view. Now, this is really cool because, yes, this, correct, that's a question. This only applies to desktop, right? So this is not going to work on GarageBand iOS um, because GarageBand iOS has no API setup for control services, whereas GarageBand on your Mac or on your desktop does. Um, now, you can see I'm moving this fader, and it's automatically controlling the volume of the third track. Again, I didn't have to do any setup for this. This just comes out of the box. Any GarageBand or Logic project that you already have is already going to work with this, right? So, you know, I can adjust my volume levels. I can also select my tracks here instead of using the plus and not minus icons. If I press the speaker again, I can even get control over pan, solo, mute, stuff like that. Anyway. That is the GarageBand slash Logic Control app. Um, just wanted to show you guys that briefly. It's very, very cool. Um, and I really like the way that the drums are laid out personally. So let me know if you guys agree with that. It's a little bit unconventional. You got toms here, all your cymbals up top. Anyway, enough GarageBand. Uh, sure, safe, all right. Um, all right, now let's... Go back to dashboard. Messed that one up. All right. And I'm going to go back to my other layout, too, because I like it more pretty. I think I had it like this. All right. So now let's take a look at, um, so some, you know, there are other, uh, I'm not going to go into Melodics right now. Melodics is another, uh, Melodics is not really a DAW. It is a software for learning finger drumming um, and, you know, instrumental music. Um, so it's a very cool app to use and we have a layout that's made just for the light pad for Melodics. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested in, you know, as someone was saying, the wanting to learn finger drumming. Melodics is a perfect way to do it, and you do get um, some type of license with your hardware uh, for Melodics. So definitely check that out. But now we're going to talk about the more freely mappable um, MIDI controller apps that are available inside of Dashboard. So these apps include Fader Block, Control Grid, Note Grid, a whole bunch of these um, a whole bunch of these apps, and some of them are geared towards playing notes, right? Using it similarly to a keyboard or a drum pad, 
Um, and some of them are more geared toward using what are called MIDI controller change messages, MIDI CCs, right? So this is more for controlling volume levels, effects, um, you know, control over your DAW, whether you want to press record now or turn on or off this track or, you know, all these different types of things. So I've kind of in my mind broken them into two different categories, which is like for notes um, and for controls. So let's look quickly at the default app. I'm calling this the default app because if you load up a light pad at any time, it will automatically have the note grid app loaded onto it. So if you've never gone to dashboard, your block probably doesn't look like this. It's probably not in minor. It's probably in major and it probably looks like this. Um, so, and hopefully you guys can, can see, all right. I know the light is now a little, maybe a little too much. Let's see if I just turn this off. My face will look less pretty, but the blocks will look better. All right. So, now, uh, this is the NoteGrid app. The NoteGrid app basically has all the same settings that we had for the Seaboard block. Um, so we don't need to go over this again. NoteGrid is straightforward. The one thing you need to know is that if you press the mode button, it will cycle through your different grid sizes. So you can have just one note. You can have, you know, four, a two by two. You can have a four by four. A little bit looks a little bit more like a traditional drum pad layout. Or you can have a 5x5, five five, which will highlight the notes of scales for you. Um, so that's good to know. Now, in terms of other uh, apps that you would use for notes specifically, there also is uh, the Drum Block app. Now, I'm just going to say that this used to be more useful than it is now, and I would actually say that there isn't much need to use the drum block app anymore because it is extremely similar to just the four by four layout of the note grid. Um, so I wouldn't say that you, anyone really needs to use it. Um, if it will have the exact same behavior basically as the four by four layout of the note grid. Um, except for that you can change the size of the grid, which again, you can also do in note grid, right? So, I don't ever really use the drum block layout, um, but that's just to just to say. That's the other one that's for, you know, note control, right? So playing notes and hearing a sound on your instrument. Um, and then the last one that can be used for playing notes is control grid. Discard changes. Um, control grid is a really nice, fully customizable one. As you can see, I had like a million uh modes in here because it's what i end up using a lot right so for example um the way that i have often let's see if i can even find these things <laughs> um well it doesn't really matter i can load any of them up like for example this is a layout that i've used to control looper devices right i do a lot of live looping and so i'll have this layout and i will use it as these will all be record buttons these will all be for arming a track, right? So track one, track two, track three, track four. Um, and then these will be down here for some kind of cool stuttering effects. Um, so this is something that I used to use a lot um, for basically an all purpose looping controller. And the way that I set that up is I went inside of the, right? So edit is the key to all this stuff, right? So click edit, and then you will get all of your global control. So here's how I can decide what overall size the grid is, right? So I chose a four by four layout for this one. Um, you can specify what MIDI channel you want to communicate on. And then this is the important part. So you can choose for each pad and the pads, this is important to know, count from the bottom left corner. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, the pads, you can choose whether they will send a MIDI note message or a MIDI controller message. The way that I was using this, I had them sending note messages even though I'm not using them for playing notes inside of an instrument, right? Um, but you can, you can set this up however you want. So let's look at, like for example, another one that I have that's set up for notes, which actually um, is on the block right next to it as well. So this is a control grid app. I have these all setting out notes. This is the one that I most traditionally use for drumming, for finger drumming. So I have them all sending notes. They're sending gates, which means 
when I press it, it's on. When I release, it's off. It could also be that I wanted it to set um, as a toggle, right? So when I press it, it turns on, and then I press it again to turn it off. But for drumming, that makes no sense. So I wanted it to be all set up for gates. And then the nice thing about control grid, which is the reason that I use it for drumming and other things like that, is that instead of the notes always being in chromatic order, like they are with a note grid, right, where it goes C, C sharp, D, here you can specify exactly which note you want for each pad, right? So I've chosen these based on how I have my drums laid out inside of Ableton. Um, so if I, you know, and it, it just depends on which, how, if you're using drum rack, if you're using another drum controller, but this allows you to specify which notes you want. And so for example, for my favorite layout, I have pad one, two, three, four, five. I have pad four and six, both set up with the same note, right? You can see they're both E. That's because I have them both as hi-hats, right? So then I can play the hi-hats like this. Right, I've got crash up here. Open hi-hat, right, so I can switch back and forth. Oh, I've got some other kicks down here. Some weird, that's like a crazy sound that I use a lot. It's actually a football tackle. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so all kinds of this stuff. So this is like, I like to have a three by three layout for playing drums. It feels like I have enough variety. I have nine different drums, um, but I also have a wide enough playing area that I don't need to be so delicate about how I'm playing, right? I can play in a little bit of a zone and still hit the same note. So that's just one way you might wanna use the control grid app to control notes. However, again, you could use it to basically be, you know, something just laid out for turning on and off tracks or doing something more like the looper setup that I have. Um, now, that leads well into using this for more control options. So, for example, the fader block, which we looked at extremely briefly at the beginning, is as you might expect, a basic app for faders. Now, if I go into edit, I don't have that many controls. All I can say is which CC number is it gonna send, which you maybe don't need to adjust because of the way that MIDI mapping works, um, and the maximum and minimum range, and then the colors, right? Um, so, another cool thing about the fader block app is that if I separate this from my other blocks, you can see that now, I have a little red indicator on the top. And what that's saying is that I'm in the first bank. So this is, you can see that I have many more than four faders in my options here, right? That is because this is fader one, fader two, fader three, fader four, but then if I press the mode button, I get fader five, fader six, fader seven, fader eight, you know, and so on and so forth. And so I can go through them like this and actually get up to 16 faders on a single block. Now, the cool thing is this block also has fader mode loaded onto it conveniently. If I connect them in, it will automatically understand the topography of the blocks layout, which then automatically knows that this, see you can see it's purple, right? We can change it to something else so you can um, see more clearly. Oh, whoops, I just have to load on the... Uh, Okay, no, 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 this one, so they do have different color layouts, but this is absolutely sending the MIDI CC message that would be associated with Fader 5, and this one is sending what's Fader 4, right? So it actually understands, if I were to load this one up, they all will uh, instantly continue on to the next block. So that's a really cool way to have, like, a large mixer if you needed to, um, and it's really nice that blocks understand their topology next to each other. Now, actually, really quickly, because we're talking about topology, a really nice thing is that some of the other apps also do this, including the default Note Grid app. So if I load up Note Grid on all of these different, let me make sure I've got the chat in here. Um, yeah, I agree. We do need a Bitwig control app. Love Bitwig. Um, if I load up all Note Grids on these blocks, you'll see that they don't look identical. That is because, um, and I'll just, I'll just take away the C4 block so we can have a little bit more 
clarity about what we're talking about here. That is because it is continuing the note layout. So let me arm an instrument so we can get, oh, that's not live. Uh, I don't know, piano? Whatever, good enough. Um, so if I play just the notes on one light pad, as you would expect, but I can also, I can move across in this direction. And it's cool because when it's laid out like this, I like to think about it kind of similarly to a guitar or a bass, right? Where these are all strings, right? So, and it is actually in fourth, similar to how a bass would be, um, or yeah, some other instruments as well. Um, so yeah, it's just nice because, right, I can seamlessly move across um, playing a chord, right? So anyway, good to know. Uh, oh, interesting that the visualizer is not giving me my third block anymore. Um, we're starting to do some crazy things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's see. Just to show different layouts. Nope. All right. Anyway. So uh, let's get back onto what we were talking about. I just really quickly wanted to show you that because a lot of people also don't realize that. And they also get confused about why the layout of their scale looks differently on the different blocks. It's because it's actually trying to adapt for you, which is really nice. Um, so let's look at, we were just talking about fader block. Um, mixer block is really similar to fader block. It's got four faders, but they also have four buttons on top. Um, so that's cool and convenient if you ever need to, uh, I'm just going to put this on the factory default because we're not using GarageBand anymore. Um, if you ever need to use buttons, they're by default set up as toggles. Um, so for example, look, let's make one of them a toggle. Let's make one of them a gate. Um, just so we can like really clearly show this kind of behavior. Um, and then I'm going to go into Ableton for us here for a second. Um, you can do this in any DAW, by the way. This is MIDI mapping. I'm just happy to use Ableton. Ableton has a nice MIDI mapping interface. Um, let's say I wanted this to control whether or not this drum rack track is on. So I just clicked the control, tapped the button, and now I can turn on or off that drum rack. And it shows me visually with the toggle, which is really nice, really nice thing about blocks and having the LED technology overall. Um, but let's say I wanted to map this one with this other button that I set up as a gate. Now this is only going to be on, we're looking at this 13 right here. This is only on if I'm holding on to the block. So that's the difference between gate and momentary. You already understand the fader. It's going to spend a long time in mixer, mixer block. Um, another really, really fun one is XYZ pad. So this is kind of like the fader app in that it's sending MIDI CC messages but it's sending three of them simultaneously based on your X position, your Y position, and your Z position, which is how hard you're pressing into the block. Um, so let's, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting that you guys keep losing this uh, other camera here, doing a lot of app switching. Um, so let's really quick, whoa. I guess I'm freaking out my blocks right now. We're only talking about one, so we can just look at one. <laughs> um, so the only thing to know about the XYZ app that's a little confusing is that you need to map it in a specific way because it's always sending all of the messages. So all three CC messages. So it's impossible to map one message in that form. So this send drop down menu is very important, right? So I want to send only the X axis now, and then let's load up like, uh, I don't know, filter. Yeah, auto filter, cool, sure, sure. Um, 
just to show this really quick, um, I want to let you guys, you know, not spend too much time here. So let's see. So now if I touch anywhere, it's going to put filter as the X message. So now if I go in here and I do Y, and then I go back to Ableton and I touch another thing like resonance, then it's going to do Y as the resonance message. And then let's say I want to send Z to something else. I don't know what it's going to be, something weird. How about rate? Um, the rate of the LFO. And then I need to make sure to go back and do send all because now I want to actually use it for its purpose. Um, so just so you can get some good visual feedback here about what we're doing. So now I'm going to go out of MIDI mapping mode. And if I move my fingers around, you can see left and right. I'm controlling the frequency of the filter up and down. I've got the resonance, right? Which is kind of what you'd expect. And then as I'm pressing into it, I'm increasing that LFO amount. So this is a really, really cool way to use a light pad that you cannot use other MIDI controllers um, by and large for these kinds of dynamic multi controls. Um, so definitely check that out. XYZ pad, very sweet. Um, yes, that is, it's a problem a lot of people run into with the XYZ pad is the mapping. You have to do that send each one at each time. Uh, style. Okay. So now what I want to talk about is something extremely cool. So you guys may have noticed that when I was in my app library that I had some apps that you do not have. Namely, these two apps here called dynamic controls. Dynamic controls. Um, I'm going to send you guys also a link to this. Um, so let me just pull that link up really quick. Um, Dynamic Controls is uh, made by some really awesome uh, Rolly users, right? So this is actually not made by Rolly directly. This is something that I downloaded, I've been a beta tester for them, um, and just today, Dynamic Controls is being released publicly. Um, so Dynamic Controls is made by um, two really smart, awesome musicians, um, Anthony uh, and Andreas um, Swoboda. Hold on, I'm gonna, I wanna make sure to look up Anthony's last name so I properly say it. So I'll, I'll pull that up in one second. I don't wanna mislead you guys. Um, but Anthony and Andreas have made this amazing app. And basically what it does is it allows you to combine all the things that we've talked about into a fully customizable layout. Um, no, they're not Team Flume, but Flume's team is also building some cool customized apps. Um, you can download Dynamic Controls and then it will load up as two different apps inside of your, uh, inside of your app library. Now there's two options. There's Dynamic Controls LE and Dynamic Controls. They're basically the same, except for one important factor. Dynamic Controls only allows you to have 16 controls in total, but you're allowed to have XY pads as one of the options. And Dynamic Controls LE allows you to have 25 controls um, with no XY pads. Now, what does this all mean? Okay, I'm gonna go into this. Um, I'm gonna discard the changes that I saved over there. And, I'm gonna go into edit. Now this is really, really cool, guys. So I'm gonna go to blank uh, just so I can show you exactly how to build this up from scratch. This is something that honestly I was waiting for for a long time, so it's really exciting to me um, that these guys put it together all on their own. It's a free app, huge, huge shout outs to the developers. And again, it is available publicly today for the first time. So how does it work? You can specify how many controls you want to have. So let's say, let's start out with two controls. Um, I want my first control to be a button, a note, or a fader. Actually, sorry, let's do it in the regular dynamic controls um, so that we can have all of our options. 
So let's make this one a fader. Now this is really cool. I can make it any size and in any position that I want. So I don't need to work with the uh, specific templates that Rolly has already given you. So for example, I want this fader to be four pixels wide. The grid of pixels is 15 by 15. So that's important to know when you're using this kind of app to understand where you're at. Um, so I want my fader to be four pixels wide and I want it to be seven pixels tall, let's say, and I want it to be green. Um, and let's move it over so it's not in the corner. For some reason, I want it to be a little bit offset. I don't even want it to be on the bottom. I want it to be just in some strange place in the middle of my light pad. And look at that, I have a fader. Honestly, this stuff is incredible. So then I could go into live and I could MIDI map this um, to control this fader. Uh, um, so now if I move the fader, I'm controlling the volume inside of live, right? This is super, super cool. I only have one control. I could make, let's see, three different controls. I want to have one that is a note, um, and one that is an XY pad. I don't know. I'm just, you know, making things up here. But you guys can see the basic concept, which is that, all right, let's have, let's have this be a note. Note, I want it to be momentary. Um, let's make it a three by three, right in that corner, right? So I've got a note. You can actually hear it, right? It's already playing a note. Um, in fact, let's make this more fun and let's map that fader to the piano sound. So now if I go back in, I'm playing my piano sound. And I'm controlling the volume of it, right? Um, and then I want to have this XY pad. Let's say I want it to be over there. It's going to be red. It's going to be seven by seven. You don't need to just click those things. I don't want to do that. And then I've got an XY pad, right? So you can see now on one controller, this is amazing. I have faders, XY pads, and notes all laid out at the same time. So I've been using this a lot. Um, for example, my basic mixer setup that I use for most of my live looping performances is a dynamic control setup, right? So this is... Um, and I can, I'll bring this over into Ableton World. Um, although I just destroyed some of these mappings because I was trying to show you guys that. Um, but my basic layout is that I have these faders set up and you can see them controlling some of the tracks that I didn't mess up just now. Um, I have this usually set up for five different instrument tracks. I have this set up as the cross fader. You can see, right? I've got this set up for controlling the Q volume, which is how loud the metronome is gonna be. And then this is master volume, which I don't wanna turn off because you guys won't hear anything. Just like that. Um, so this is something I use all the time. This is just like a perfect little, really compact mixer that I've made for exactly my type of performances. Um, another, Another way of using it, for example, is I've started, I was showing you my three by three drum layout, which has been my traditional drum layout for a while. Um, this is another version that I've made, which is even more customized to what I wanna do. Um, so let's just make sure the track is armed, which it should be. Turn off the piano. So similar to the three by three, except for that I've made the entire bottom section all a kick drum. And I've made this section all a snare, right? So it's like I've elongated these two sections. I have my hi-hats here and my cymbals. So it's just another way for me to... So again, being able to customize your instruments for exactly how you want, or something really experimental that I set up um, that's kind of based on this, uh, it's based on this really <laughs> crazy uh, Kalimba Mbira thing that I have called the Array Mira. Um, and this I've set up, and this is like a totally alternative way to control your instrument sounds. So you can see 
I've got, let's bring this up here. Um, so I've set this up to be almost kind of like a string instrument where you slide past the notes. So this is like, you know, just I was experimenting with what kind of alternative, really alternative ways you can set up because I can specify exactly which notes I want, right? These are all the same note in different octaves. Right, and not in a traditional way. Um, so really, really cool. There's a huge, huge amount of potential um, with this Dynamic Controls app. Um, yes, if you guys have any questions, please toss them into the Q&A section. I can't uh, promise that I'm going to hit all of the um, questions that are in the chat. So any questions, if you have been asking questions in the chat, please try to remember what they are and throw them in the Q&A because that's the only way I can stay uh, reasonably organized. Um, so Dynamic Controls is amazing. Definitely download it. Again, it's free. Um, and I'm going to... Right now, uh, take a second uh, to just find this link for you guys, and I'm going to post it um, so that you can have access to it. Uh, give me one second. So again, this is made by Andreas Swoboda and Anthony Alfimov, I believe, is how you pronounce his name. Um, really, really cool programmers um, and musicians. Check it out. It is at, let me get this link. It is on swanick.com slash dynamic controls. I'm going to put it in the chat. Great, someone else just put it in the chat. Amazing, thank you guys. Um, please check it out. It is a really, really, really cool thing. Um, something that I think was much needed in Dashboard. So, now, where are we at? We've pretty much gone through most of the stuff that I wanted to get to, which is good, because we're, uh, we're good on time. Um, the one thing that I didn't talk about um, but isn't too complicated is uh, if you're using a control block. Um, let me make sure to pull up my, my camera. All right. Um, if you're using a control block, ooh, a little offset, interesting. Um, the control block will, by default, be in factory default, of course. Um, however, if you want to use it as a customizable controller, so for example, I often use my loop lock with customized settings, um, you can s go into MIDI CC mode. This is important. It's really easy to miss this. If you click it and then it's highlighted, then you're in the customizable, mappable MIDI CC mode, which means that then you can specify the behaviors, the MIDI CC values, the colors. Um, so for example, I often use a layout like this for Ableton um, in which I have, oh, I'm just gonna show you here, in which I have this set up for record. This is session record, play, metronome, uh, I think this goes back to the beginning of the song. And then this goes through the different uh, scenes, right? So you go scene, 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 and then you can play and go back through scenes. Just to show you how I'm moving through scenes over here, um, that basic functionality. So that's a MIDI CC mode layout that I've saved again, always. File, save as. You can even save something as your default mode if you want. Um, okay, so that's 
that's most of what I wanted to get through. Um, there, a little bonus thing is that if you are a programmer like you know Anthony or um, Andreas, and uh, and you want to get even further into Blocks, Blocks does have an open SDK, so you can download an application called Blocks Code. And Blocks Code, oh, this is a really terrible looking program that I wrote a while ago. But Blocks Code allows you to actually write programs for your blocks. So this is how you can create an app, right? We've been talking about creating modes, but this is how you can create an app. Um, this is a fun one that I made a while ago. Um, and once you create an app, you can load it up inside of Dashboard. Um, this is Snake. Maybe you guys have heard of it before. Um, so I could use the light pad controls. And you can see it actually even generates some mini notes. Oops. <laughs> so this is a fun thing that I programmed. Um, so if anyone is a programmer or wants to get into programming, it's a pretty easy uh, language to learn. I am not really... Um, much of a computer science person, just a novice. Um, so you can do fun stuff like make snake MIDI controller games. Um, and there's other fun things to check out in Dashboard for sure, like Music Gen is another really fun one that's just like kind of a weird little sequencer where you can create these little note shooters. That's a fun one. This is all sending real MIDI notes, right? Like to Ableton. Like if I were to load a piano, I'd be a piano instead, right? Anyway, that's just a fun one. More experimental, very hard to use in a, uh, you know, controlled way. All right. Now I'm going to hit up these questions, guys, and let's try to get through these. Um, I know we're a little bit over the hour. Hopefully you guys have, um, hopefully you guys have, you know, time to check it out. Let's see. How do I even, okay, very annoying that it will not let me go to Q&A when I'm in full screen. I'll forgive it, I guess. Okay, so let's see. All right. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna maybe go backwards through the questions. Okay. Dynamic controls answers all the questions. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. No, no, no worries. Um, yes, dynamic controls is a huge question answer, answerer and game changer um, for using blocks. You can basically do anything. Um, Yes, the snake game I programmed inside of Blocks Code. That's Lucas was asking that question. How did I get it? Um, I wrote out that code. It's you know anyone who knows programming would probably scoff at my programming sensibilities, but it works. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. MIDI channel settings are blurry. What more can I learn about it? Um, yeah, the MIDI channel settings, uh, where could you learn more about it? <laughs> there aren't that many uh, great places to, uh, but if you look up how MPE works, they will give you some more answers about how the MIDI, oh, sorry. Uh, if you look up how MPE works, it will give you some more um, insight into how the MIDI settings are actually functioning. Again, what I can say to get you in the right direction is that with MPE, every finger touch is put onto its own MIDI channel. And so you can have up to 15 channels of independent control, uh, including the, I mean, sorry, not including a global channel, which is used for things like sustain pedal and other stuff like that. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, we're getting more. Sorry, I'm going to actually start at the top. This is a foolish way to do this. Okay. Uh, what would be the quickest way to record an automation on a parameter with the light pad? Um, any of these apps that I've shown that have MIDI CC controls, you can use to record automation. So 
if I were any of these apps, um, so for example, if I were to load up the fader block app um, and then I go into Ableton, um, let's make it not full screen. Um, if I were to be in a longer standing mode, I have to make sure that my automation arm is on, which it is. Um, and I need to also make sure whenever you're doing automation, this is going to be depend on whatever program you're using, but you need to make sure that you have remote selected if you're using, um, <clears throat> if you're using Ableton Live. Uh, now let's see if I want to go in and I'm just going to delete these other mappings. Let's say I want to have contact be controlled by this fader. If I go to the beginning and I record, and I move the fader up and down and up and down. Then I've recorded automation. So any of these things can be used to record automation to answer that question from Martin or Martine. I don't know. Um, uh, Howard was asking a question about the Rolly Sound Store, the expansions listed there for individual instruments uh, or just for Rolly Studio. I was interested in taking advantage of the expansion pack Unfortunately, Rolly Studio is not compatible with my OS. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm going to have to look into that. I actually am also new to the Rolly Sound Store, which um, the Rolly Sound Store just got released. Um, so I'm also completely new to that. I'm going to have to look into that and give you a better um, piece of advice as to what you should do because you are on an older operating system. Although I respect um, <laughs> defying the Apple updates. Uh, sometimes can cause problems. Although might want to go up, you know, if you can, if your computer can handle it. Um, but yeah, I'll have to look into that for you. Uh, let's see. I've been trying to get my Seaboard to work with Complete. I have it working with Contact, but Complete doesn't seem to map. All I get is single note in each library. A single note. I'm not sure exactly. Oh, okay. I bet I know what the problem is. So, uh, the problem that you're having most likely with complete, if you're only getting a single note to play in each library, I'm assuming is that you probably have your hardware set up in, if I go to note grid, in MPE mode, when you m most likely want it to be in single channel mode because contact and complete are not MP compatible yet. Although there is a very cool contact library that is MP compatible. They did that in a crazy workaround way, but most of the time not MP compatible. So you're going to want to choose single channel mode and hopefully that will fix your problem. Ross Fox. Um, yes, let's see. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and these are just questions about, can you use it if you have the Seaboard um, dashboard? Yes, as I said for, um, as I said for dashboard, the Seaboard, you're going to have settings, very important MIDI settings that you need to access in dashboard. You just won't have the app library interface. Um, transpose the Lightpad block in the NoteGrid app. Absolutely. Okay, wait, this is actually a good question and I probably should have touched on this. So. I don't like the way that this works, but it is the way that it works. This transpose option here is numbers instead of notes. This can be very confusing for people. What this means is zero assumes C is the bottom left corner. If you change it to one, it will assume C sharp is in the bottom left corner. Um, so I do wish it was, uh, note names, but it is numbers, unfortunately. Um, but it's pretty easy to understand once you figure it out. Um, so that's how you transpose the light pad. You choose which your root note is, and then you choose your scale. Um, so that is that. Oh, whoops, I wasn't, I didn't, hadn't clicked the answer button, but basically the answer is, uh, you choose your transpose number. C being zero, and then your scale. Um, what's the difference between MPE and multi-channel? Yes, so the difference between MPE and multi-channel um, is not something that almost anyone will need to pay attention to. However, Rolly has decided to leave in the multi-channel option. 
this is really a legacy option. In fact, it at one point was called legacy. MPE and multi-channel are the same concept, except for that multi-channel was created at a time before MPE had been formalized. So before it was formalized, we still had the concept of using different MIDI channels for each finger. However, there was no global channel to do send global messages. MPE always has a global channel. This is the only difference between these two. I would always use MPE or single channel unless you absolutely know what you're doing and for some reason need to use multi-channel. Um, we really just left it in for people who have had setups that already had those uh, originally. Uh, yes, I can give you a link to last week's webinar on Equator. Um, if anyone has it quickly, uh, that would be cool. I, uh, I had it recently. It's a YouTube video. It's just on Rolly's YouTube page. So, um, Equator. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Equator sound design with Ruben Dax. That's me. Um, okay, now we're we're in webinar inception. Webinars in webinars. Um, but let me put this in the chat for you here. Um, okay, so uh, custom MIDI controls from Swanick. Um, someone was asking about this before I even sent it. Oh, before I even mentioned it. it. Says functionality Rolly will provide in the roadmap. Um, I can't speak to the roadmap, the development roadmap at all, um, unfortunately. Uh, I don't really have um, insight into exactly where things are going to be going. Uh, but it is definitely important to it is definitely important to keep dashboard as updated as possible. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if they will build in functionality similar to dynamic controls. However, dynamic controls works great. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, how would you share any apps? That you create. Um, the only way that you can share apps that you create um, at the moment is that you can go uh, into documents. Well, this is on a Mac, right? It's going to be a little different on Windows. I'm sorry for anyone who's on Windows. Documents, Rolly, Littlefoot are where all of your apps are saved. They're dot Littlefoot files. Littlefoot is the programming language, the scripting language that Blocks uses. Um, so you can actually share these files, um, and they should work. Cool. Thanks for letting me know about the Equator update. Pretty funny that that happened at the same time. Does Blocks have its own CPU power? It has its own memory, um, and yes, it is doing some degree of processing on board, um, but it's processing uh, MIDI and light messages only. So it doesn't need to have a very powerful processor, but yes, yes, it does. Um, someone is saying, I use Logic Pro as my DAW. I also have Ableton Live, light. The version you have shown us, is this functionality in light or the full version of Ableton? Any functionality that I've shown you should totally be applicable in live light. Please let me know if I'm uh, totally mistaken on that and saying something crazy, but I don't think there's anything that I showed you that wouldn't be applicable in Live Light. Live Light is more about restricting how many channels you have um, and such things like that. Um, but you can also do all of this MIDI mapping inside of Logic. Again, all MIDI mapping is available in pretty much any DAW. I could easily have been using Logic, Reaper, Bitwig. You can do MIDI mapping. The things that are specific are the DAW specific templates, right? So uh, these. GarageBand, Logic, Ableton Live Control, those only work with certain DAWs. All of the rest of them are going to work with any DAW that you want, but you will have to set up the MIDI mapping. The DAW specific templates will have all the MIDI mapping set up beforehand. Something I was going to mention that people might run into if anyone here is an Ableton user. I was saying that when you connect a block, by default, it will always have this control script turned on and selected. Oh. Really messed up the audio there for a second. Um, <clears throat> it will always be selected. This is great if you want to use the Ableton Control app. However, you may run into some confusion because if you have MIDI mapped anything with channel one, 
it will have a conflict very likely with the control script. So I would suggest one of two things. Either don't do any of your MIDI mappings using channel one if you want to use the control script at the same time, or turn off the control script by selecting none on control surfaces. You will sometimes run into an issue there. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see. Uh, someone is asking about uh, I actually can't tell what they were asking. Um, chances of app for Reaper. Not sure. However, shouts out to Reaper is an incredible DAW. Has a lot of potential that you can't do in other places. Um, but I can't speak to whether or not there will be a Reaper-specific control script in the future. OK. Um, regarding the hardware-software connection, if the interface is not matching the hardware configuration, how can we force it to do so? As I said, a lot of times um, the visualization problem is really just a matter of the blocks being slightly misaligned or the magnets, um, the magnetic system uh, being maybe dirty or having some kind of issue. So a lot of times it just takes a little bit of physical adjustment of where your block is at to get the visualizer to work properly. Um, oh, well, I forgot to press the answer button on that one, but sometimes it's a little physical adjustment. Um, yes, you can record, yes, you can record automation cutoff filter with the light pad. I just uh, showed that for an earlier question. Um, is there a way to turn my block? Interesting. Very interesting question. My block is set up like yours, USB cable at the top, the bottom right corner. Yep. Is there a way to turn it? There isn't a way to turn the block that is connected. However, a really cool thing is that the other blocks will automatically adapt to whichever block you have physically connected. So let's say, for example, um, sorry, I'm just moving these windows that I think you guys can't see. So it probably looks like I'm crazy. Um, <clears throat> For example, I have a fader block here. Um, all of my power buttons are aligned, so all my blocks are in the same orientation. The cool thing about the block's topography recognition is that I can take this, I can turn it into the wrong orientation, connect it in, and voila, as soon as it's connected, it will be in the correct orientation. So it's really cool that uh, blocks will auto-orient to whichever block is connected with USB or connected with Bluetooth. If this is the block that's connected with Bluetooth, you do not need to connect any other blocks over Bluetooth. You just physically snap them in and they will all orient properly. Alan was asking, does Dashboard have a timeout in the app if it has had no input for a period of time? Um, there shouldn't be a timeout. However, if you go into any other MIDI app, so if I go into Ableton and then if I look at Garage, uh, Dashboard, you can see that Dashboard says it's being controlled by another application. So Dashboard will only take control over your blocks when it's in focus, um, which is good because you then get less of an issue of confusing MIDI messages. Is the XY pad on the rise include a Z pressure axis? No, there is no Z axis for the rise XY pad. It is only XY which is also true if you were to load up the Rise controller app. Um, let's put it on this side. Gotta love just rearranging things. Um, and this XY pad here, which looks a lot like the XYZ app, but it's the part of the Rise controller app. I didn't talk about this today because I went over it a fair amount last week. Um, this just simulates the control panel that you have on the side of the Rise. This will not respond to pressure as well. It's only XY because it's meant to simulate the rise. Um, okay. If I have a Seaboard Rise 25, what benefit do I have from also having blocks? And if I have a couple blocks, what should I add? Uh, if you're a Rise 25, I mean, I think we've gone over very extensively what the potential benefits of um, having blocks is. 
So I would say that, yes, if you want to have a customizable controller, if you want to be able to control drums, faders, you know, effects, uh, Blocks is going to be able to do that in a more user-friendly way than you would if you were trying to set up the key waves of the Seaboard to do it. Um, however, you know, you might not need it if really what you're trying to do is just play MPE notes um, and get that kind of functionality. <clears throat> Uh, dynamic controls, yes, you can download um, from the link that we set up. Uh, okay, this is a little bit outside of the scope question about GarageBand. Um, sometimes Glissando doesn't work or only with one note only. Um, it's a little bit interesting. So GarageBand, the, all of the instruments, not all of them, many of the instruments are... MPE and 5D touch compatible. However, not all of them, and it does get a little confusing. Some of them have a pitch bend range of 12. Some of them have a pitch bend range of 48. Um, you kind of have to experiment to see which ones are good. But a lot of them, it is really amazing that a lot of them do work with the five dimensions of touch. So that's most of the built-in sounds in Logic and GarageBand, um, Alchemy, all those things that are built in there. Um, Cool. Hold on. I think I saw these before. The Snake app. Uh, can we use the block? Uh, yeah, I can share with you guys. I think it should work to share with you the mode from Dynamic Controls. Although it might not because I'm using the beta. So it's it's very easy to set up though. It's just about making all of your notes only one pixel tall. Um, so I might not be able to send it to you because it might not be cross-compatible, but um, either way, it's pretty easy to set up. Um, this is a question, can we use a loop block with Reaper? Absolutely. As long as you put the loop block in MIDI CC mode, like I was saying before, um, MIDI CC mode will then allow you to make it a totally open mappable controller, so you can absolutely use it with Reaper. Ah, Blocks Code. This is a great question. I'm going to type the answer to this because um, it's not so easy to find where Blocks Code is laid out. Um, one second. Let's see. I'm going to find uh, where it is. It's, it's, at, it's actually on juice.com. Juice is the C++ framework that a lot of music software is built with um, that is part of the Roly family. Um, and OK, this is how you get blocks code. I'm going to put it into the Q&A right here. So everyone should be able to get that from Louise. OK, uh, oh, whoops. Yeah, I just did that also. Link to blocks code, great. Um, Previously, you were only able to use noise sounds by using your device as a MIDI sound source. Can they now do this more directly? I want to record the swam sax sounds. Uh, you cannot record the swam sax sounds on in your computer um, unless you just route the audio out from your iOS device into your computer. You can't load swam specifically um, in Roly Studio because... Uh, SWAM is made by a, this really amazing sound design team called Audio Modeling, um, and they have their own plugins, so we have not incorporated um, their sounds into our plugin, but you can still use it in the Noise app if you wanted to route audio out, for example. Ah, yes. The MPE-compatible contact library is called... Auras by Slate and Ash. Auras, Slate and Ash. I almost don't want to share this with you guys because I feel like it's an amazing secret weapon that I have. Um, but I'm just kidding. I love giving you guys the ability to do these things. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna find the uh, the link right now and send it over. Um, Auras is amazing. It is actually being used in a lot of the. Uh, movies and TV stuff that's being made right now because it's an incredible, incredible uh, 
sound design film score type vibe um oh i wanted to put this as a typed question but i did live answer hmm uh well i'll put it just in the chat this is slate and ash auras um okay let's see explain the difference between gate and toggle oh example of trigger trigger sends i believe in fact you know what Let's get real nerdy with it, and let's look at it so that I don't leave anyone, lead anyone astray. Um, so this, the question, the question here is, what, I was talking a lot about gate and toggle because those are the ones that I use the most. What is the deal with trigger? So let's set up a trigger control. And let's see exactly how the MIDI message gets sent. So we're talking about, we're just going to do pad one. Um, we want it to be a controller change message. We are going to filter out all of these silly system exclusive messages. This is a cool little um, utility called MIDI monitor. If anyone ever really wants to know what kind of MIDI messages are coming out of any of their tools. So trigger what it does is it sends an on message and then there's a delay and then it sends an off message. It pays absolutely no attention to your finger leaving the surface. So it's always going to send on and off. Um, hopefully that is clear. Uh, would I recommend GarageBand or Logic Pro 10? Um, Logic is a much more sophisticated uh, DAW. And if, oh, I was not sharing my screen for the trigger message. Let me let me quickly go back in. I'm sorry about that. And I wasn't even showing you MIDI monitor. This is MIDI monitor here. It's very very cute. Um, sorry guys, missed that. Um, so wait, let me really quickly show you again what I was talking about, about trigger. So when you use a trigger command. It sends on, which is 127, and then off with a little delay. No matter how hard I hit it, how fast I hit it, how hard, how long I hold on, it pays no attention to me taking my finger off the surface. Um, so that's that's trigger. Um, someone here says trigger mode is useful for looped samples. Totally. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. Let's go back in. Okay, this question is, how can you pre-record drum loops into the control grid? You cannot uh, record anything into control grid, right? Control grid is a MIDI controller, so it is sending the controls that then control your software, which may have loops in it. Um, if that were the case, you could easily um, have a loop set up and have it get triggered, oops, and have it get triggered, um, by your control grid just with some basic mini mapping so let's do this right so you can imagine um if you were to expand that out that you can definitely record drum loops um and play them back using the control grid um but just to clarify you can't record anything into um the app directly I'm not sure what issue, Jonathan, you're having with your Seaboard block uh, not displaying after saving it, your modes. Um, it should totally work. You just make sure that your firmware is updated. That's the other. Uh, sorry, we got these drums going here. Um, <laughs> make sure that your Seaboard block is at the newest firmware. That's definitely a big thing. Um, and firmware updating is done through dashboard. That's something I probably should have mentioned at the very beginning. Um, you click this updates button. Um, oops, got to turn on my seaboard. Got to move it into a spot you can see. Now we want some light. Um, so yeah, it should work to be able to save modes. If you just click here, like I have these different modes saved. Um, 
so I'm not sure what the issue is. Try updating your firmware um, and make sure you do save as and then click on it to recall. Someone's saying their USB-C cable doesn't work. Make sure it's a USB-C cable that sends data as well as power. It's very confusing because there are USB-C cables, for example, for charging your MacBook that don't send data. They only do power. You have to have one that does both. Um, someone's asking, how did I set up the string layout on my light pad? Um, I'll show you the settings that I have in it, um, and you can get a basic idea of what I did. Again, this is using the Dynamic Controls app. Um, apps. Dynamic Controls. And I did Dynamic Controls LE because I wanted to have the full 25 notes. Discard changes. Select array. Um, these are the types of settings that I have. So they're pretty much the same for all of them, as you might imagine. All of them have a height of one. Um, and a width of three. And then I've just set up the notes to be however the notes that I want. For this one, I chose to have them all be the same note in different octaves. Um, and I've just moved them into their positions. So it's pretty self-explanatory to figure out how to use this. It just you know takes a second for you to understand the basic concept um, of how dynamic controls works, but it's really well made and easy to use. Um, oh, sorry, I should have I should have clicked the answer button, but hopefully that came through. That was from Freddie. Um, is there a way? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, yeah, is there a way to Get the Rolly Light Pad Block Fader Mode and Loop Block Transport to control Pro Tools. Uh, yes, you should be able to map MIDI map inside of Pro Tools as well. I haven't used Pro Tools in many years. I used to use it for work um, when I did some live sound studio stuff. Uh, however, I have not done any MIDI mapping in Pro Tools in many years, but I assume it should be there considering it's the industry standard. It would be a shame if you couldn't do MIDI mapping. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into questions specifically about uh, too many questions about contact right now. It's just a topic of a whole different webinar. But if you guys are interested um, in that kind of stuff, definitely feed that back to Rolly so we can figure out what our next webinar topic is going to be. Uh, noise app can be used on, it's only a mobile app. The noise app is only a mobile app. It is iOS and some very few um, Android um, operating systems, I think, also allow you to use it. As far as I know, Pro Tools is not MPE compatible yet from Marcelo. Can you custom map the Seaboard block can you custom map the Seaboard block keys to CCs like you did in the XYZ pad? You actually cannot with the default settings. So if I plug in a Seaboard block here, oh, there goes my cable. Um, also, again, all this stuff can be connected via Bluetooth. I'm just using a cable to make it a little bit easier because I'm moving so many things around at the same time. Um, <clears throat> if I go back into dashboard. There isn't a way to uh, map your Seaboard block to make these into controller change messages as opposed to note messages. However, every key does, by the way that it works, send a controller change message. And that controller change message on the y-axis is slide CC74. So you can change this number to something else if you wanted to use the slide mechanism uh, on your seaboard block to control something, maybe a parameter fader of some kind. You could do that, but you're not going to get much further than that. You can't use it as the full XYZ compatibility that you're thinking because pressure is always set to pressure, which is a specific message. It's not a CC message. Um, and uh, left and glide movement is always set to pitch bend. So you don't actually have full control over those, um, those settings.
someone's asking about using Swift programming language uh, for development learning Roly. Right now, uh, you have to use the blocks code IDE um, with the Littlefoot programming language, although there is someone who a while ago made a very cool JavaScript web browser version of blocks code. Um, in fact, uh, I, I will have to find that link and see if it still works. So I don't want to share it before knowing if it works, but I'll email it out to you guys if it does. Um, so it's a way to use JavaScript, which is really nice and much more familiar for um, a number of people. Um, someone's asking about the string setup. Again, uh, I don't know that I'll be able to transfer it from the beta to the version you guys have, but uh, it's very easy to set up. I just showed you guys the parameters here. So super easy to get it going. Um, and I'd love to see what things you guys set up yourself. Uh, quickly trans Is there a way to quickly transpose by Octave note grid on the LightPad block when it's connected to an iOS device? There's no dashboard for iOS yet. Uh, yes, this is a bit of an issue. In fact, the only way to do it is to connect it to your computer, change the settings, which again, gets saved to the hardware. All settings from dashboard instantly get saved to the hardware. So you can connect to your computer, put it in whatever scale or transpose you want, and then reconnect it to your iOS app, um, and it will maintain those settings. The Noise app does not work in Windows, nor does it work on any desktop computer. Are we seeing demand for a larger physical size light pad? It's a cool idea. Um, I can't speak necessarily to how much demand, but I definitely have um, anecdotally had people ask me about it. Um, I think it would be cool. I mean, I, you know. I love being able to have more surface area to mess around with, um, especially with something you know as customizable as dynamic controls. It'd be really cool to have more, um, more surface area. So yeah, feed that back to Roly if that's what you're something you're looking for. Uh, again, making the strings the string layout like I advised. The way to do it is just to make sure that your in dynamic controls, you've chosen the note layout. Ah, weird audio problem. Hmm. Not sure why we're having this audio issue all the time. Very strange. Um, again, the way to get it is just to make sure that you have chosen note as your controller type um, inside of dynamic controls, right? So make sure you choose note. And then all I did was make the height one to make it more similar to the strings. Um, it's really super easy, actually. Um, I did this very quickly. All right, guys. I think I'm going to wrap it up. I think I've gotten through uh, all of the questions. Let me look back really quick. Um, thank you guys so much for joining in. I'm really happy to be able to give this kind of information. Um, Blocks dashboard and Rolly dashboard in general does not get a lot of um, screen time and people often misunderstand it. So having as many Rolly users empowered about how to use dashboard um, is really great for us um, and for people being able to make way cooler content with it. So if you guys, you know, start making any cool things, um, please share them, uh, find them. You can send it to me. My name is Ruben Dax. Um, again, if you want to find me anywhere, you can uh, check out rubendax.com. Um, and feel free to reach out and send me any of the cool stuff that you guys are making. Thanks again so much. And this has been a deep dive into Rolly Dashboard.